um, so so we'll take it from there. And um, now I am now in Chris. I am in the Center for Railway Information Systems. It is an autonomous body which operates on a not-for-profit model. It was set up by the Ministry of Railways in, in 1986. So it was quite, uh, um, I, I would say at that time, it was quite a visionary um, concept that you build a, a small organization within your larger organization, which concentrates only on the development of information systems. At that time, it was not even very clear that information systems would take such a leading role as they have today. It wasn't very certain how it would progress. But certainly at that time, we knew that um, information systems would become quite uh, important as, as, as time passed, because uh, many could see that there was uh, information was becoming primary and processing that large volumes of information not possible through manual methods. And at that time, of course, it was in its infancy in India, in, in India, but other countries we could see were going down that path of adopting large scale automation of information. So that is how this CRIS was set up. And as, as you know, the mandate is to design, develop, implement, operate, maintain information systems for Indian railways. And now also architect a holistic vision and go along that vision for information systems in the Indian railways. So as you can see, um, all of us have been traveling by railways and uh, we all of us have uh, our uh, experiences. And Indian railways is of course quite a large system. It is uh, amongst the largest ones in the world. So the size is huge. And it is not just that it is a large organization. It is spread across a very large geographical area. And that spread is accompanied by actual assets on the ground in the form of railway tracks, in the form of our overhead uh, electrification equipment, which goes all across the country. So there is a geospatial angle also to the whole system. It is not just enough that uh, it is not uh, like a, a, a business with offices in a number of cities. It is actually physically, geographically distributed. There are a large number of stations. There are many passenger trains. Of course, this is uh, these figures are from before the COVID pandemic. I have taken the figures of 2019-20 for that reason. And Freight trains, there are a large number of freight trains, you know, passenger trains, freight trains, we do both. And uh, as you can see, roughly each passenger journey is around 150, 140 kilometers is the average passenger journey. But this is because there are many, many suburban journeys which are less than 50 kilometers. So, uh, but still, um, it is a large system. On an average, a freight consignment is carried for six, 600 kilometers. Now, all of this, when we run train services, we need a lot of infrastructure. And the infrastructure is in uh, the form of fixed infrastructure, that is the tracks and the overhead electrification equipment, the signals, and the locomotives, the passenger coaches, freight wagons. So all of these are managed and maintained. And therefore, as you can see, there are large numbers and that generates a large volume of, uh, of uh, data and information. Similarly, passengers, there are so many originating passengers. It is more than the population of the country actually, but that is because there are about uh, 40 to 50 lakh passengers who travel daily in local trains in, in Mumbai and Calcutta. So that counts for a very large number of originating journeys, all of those uh, journeys have tickets, so they generate a large volume of traffic. And originating freight also, we have uh, a few years back, we burst this thousand million tons originating freight loading. And now we have gone up to around 1,200 million tons. So the whole system is quite large. And the 
annual revenue is now exceeding 2 lakh crores. And if you also add the capital expenditure that we do, this is just the revenue that we get. But if you add the capital ex expenditure, that is now another 1 lakh 60,000, 1 lakh 70,000 crores. So the total figure is almost, it is touching 4 lakh crores now is the amount of uh, money that is that is either expenditure or revenues that is being handled in by the railways in a year. So whatever way you look at it, the volumes are large. As Dr. Rajaram had said, this is one thing that willy nilly we have had to specialize in, in managing these large transactions. So very quickly, if you take a functional view of the railways, now you'll see, you can see here, I've just put this so that uh, we can understand the, the, the different activities that we take. For example, we operate trains and then we also load and unload freight and provide, uh, you know, we, we manage the freight part of it. Oh, sorry, it, it, it seems to be a little hard. We manage the freight part, then we manage passengers, so we provide them tickets. Then we manage the people who are running the trains. Then we dispatch and control trains. And then if you see here, you um, then we maintain the rolling stock. We track and trace uh, rolling stock. We maintain fixed infrastructure. We manage freight terminals. We provide passenger amenities. We manage passenger terminals. And then we have uh, much more to do. We have rolling stock links. We overhaul the rolling stock. We design and manufacture our own rolling stock. We manage occupational health of our people. We manage capacities. We build new railway lines. That building also is done by railways. We manage claims and disputes. We prepare train schedules. We monitor traffic. And then we also have the materials, the finance and human resources to manage. So functionally, you will see that the railways is much larger than most of the other uh, facilities, most of the other organizations, because functionally, there are so many things. You, Manufacturing, large manufacturing enterprise, yes. Train operations, yes. Large maintenance, uh, MRO type of operations, yes, we do it. Huge human resources, training requirements, learning and development, yes. Materials, lot of material movement, warehousing, yes, we do it. Transportation, yes, of course. Managing lot of finance, um, managing large number of financial transactions, high value financial transactions, yes. One project of uh, with with a large suppose it's a section of track, it is it is a project of uh, twenty thousand crores. If we are making a, a freight corridor, a larger project that is recently we have we have two uh, project freight corridors more than a one lakh crore. So they are huge projects, huge. Um, operations that are being managed. So, and it's a very, very, it is a very diversified organization. It is fully um, vertically integrated in, in all senses of the world. So the functionality is very, very diverse and complex. But if we reduce this to the major functions, then we can actually reduce it to these major verticals. And if you see, you start with the passenger services and freight services. This is what we offer to our customers. Either they are passengers and they are traveling across the country or they are freight consigners, consignees, and they are moving across the, the country. Their consignments are moving across the country as well. And 
then the, the passengers, of course, they are, they are, there's some things on the screen, which I don't know whether you can see. I hope you can't. Just a minute, right. Anyway, so I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, very much visible, clear. Okay, I, I, I see some red stripes on this thing, which somehow I think uh, because this file is shared. So, but anyway, I think we can just live with those. So, uh, then now these passenger services and trade services are abstractions actually, and they are implemented through the passenger terminals and freight terminals. When we say passenger terminals, we mean stations and they're running. And freight terminals now mean uh, where we load and unload the freight. And freight loading and unloading now is getting quite complex. It just used to be uh, what we used to call a goods shed, where we used to carry the goods and just load it into a train. But now goods are becoming very diverse, as I said. There are containers, as you know, shipping containers. So shipping containers, we also have roll-on and roll-off services. Roll-on, roll-off means um, trucks being loaded directly onto railway, special railway wagons. And then the train moves with those trucks on board. And then at its destination, the trucks are rolled off. So apart from normal freight, which is uh, coal, or food grain that is either carried in bags, like food grain, cement, they are normally bagged. Coal is open and we carry a lot of coal, about 50% of the traffic that we carry right now is coal. So freight terminals themselves have become very complex now because the diverse sort of various different uh, types of traffic. Right. Okay. So, um, then we have, uh, then we have train operations. Now train operations is a peculiar uh, set of fun functionalities because this is unique to railways and it is quite information intensive. The reason is that if you have a car, if you are in a road vehicle and you come to a red light, then if you go past the red light, then there is a chance that you will have an accident. But if you are driving a train and you pass a red light, it is not a chance that you will have an accident. You will have an accident. The reason is that that red light is there. The signal is there to guide you completely through your journey. You will encounter a red light only when there is a train in front of you, which is so close that if you start braking that, that time, you cannot brake in time. That is what a red light indicates. So as soon as you sight the red light and you normally you are able to sight the red light at a distance that you can safely brake before you reach the red light. So the very fact that you are sighting a red light means that you have to stop. That means that there is very precise control which is required during the entire journey of the train. So information intensive operations are there in railways. Each track can only be shared by one train. So you have to keep a tab very, very accurate tag, tab on where your train is and how it is moving. For that, we have all these complex signaling systems. And then to manage the signaling systems, you need some uh, processes that now you would like to, you would like to automate. So that is how um, railways operations is different from others. It is not like running a set of, uh, I mean, it's not like running a bus line where you can, once the bus leaves the, your terminal, after that, it is the driver's lookout, how, how he ensures that he drives safely. Whereas here, the whole operation is part of a very large operations organization that has to make sure that each train is managed well. And naturally, for that, we have fixed infrastructure. Fixed infrastructure, I mean the tracks, 
the signals, the electrification equipment, the station buildings, the control offices. So there are a lot of fixed infrastructure that is uh, part of the railways, the bridges. So, and the rolling stock that uh, runs on it, the rolling stock are the locomotives, the wagons, the passenger coaches, the train sets, the EMUs that are running on, on that track. All of it has to be actively managed. Right now, everything is being done by the Indian Railways. Different departments are doing all of these activities. And then, as I said, at, at the lowest layer is the human resources. As you know, we have around 12 lakh employees. So, and since we have so many diverse operations, so many diverse functional areas, we have a diversity of skills. We have many, many skills that need to be managed and all the learnings, um, as, as you know, technology change is increasing and railways is a large engineering enterprise. So even the capability management, human capability management, capacity management part is a fairly complex operation. And then finance management, large amounts of uh, money are involved. And materials, again, very, very diverse and large variety of materials are procured, not only for maintaining and managing the facilities that we have, but also to run and operate the trains. For example, we need a lot of fuel. We, are, we acquire a lot of power. And uh, we just to keep uh, the system operational, there are a lot of uh, materials that we need to um, run the system. So it is fairly complex, but this is how we have distilled all these, uh, all the processes into verticals. And they, by and large, mimic the organizational structure of the railways also, naturally. But there is a slight amount of, uh, we have tried to ensure that we are able to simplify things to the extent that we can structure them as far as the processes are concerned. So now we come to the, the past. So this is, this is where we start the, the, this is where we started actually in 1967. I hope you, I, I hope you can see the screen. It's not too, too small or the print. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yes, it is. Okay, fine. So then here you can see that we started uh, as early as 1967. In 1967, we, start, we set up our EDP centers and we opened EDP centers, electronic data processing centers. And these were primarily for three, three things. One was the management of the um, payroll, which was the, the main, uh, main function was payroll. So payrolls for for groups of uh, people and slowly different uh, offices were taken up under the payroll, workshops, offices, all of them were taken up under the payroll. So primary function was payroll, then inventory management. Inventory management was a batch process, a monthly process in which each month the inventories were totted up and it was uh, the critical inventories were identified. What is the material that is likely to be in short supply? What is the material that is not covered by purchase orders, for example. And the third was uh, revenue uh, reconciliation. Revenue reconciliation is because you get revenue at different stations. And then at that time, all these transactions were cash transactions, including many of the freight transactions were in cash. So all that cash collecting from all these diverse locations, it used to take up to six months. And then you had to reconcile everything that what you had thought that you have collected, have you actually collected that much, that much revenue? So all of that was uh, done in batches in the EDP centers and slowly all the EDP centers came up till 1970. And as I said, we also produce, we also manufacture our own locomotives and our own uh, coaches and a little bit of our wagons also, but mainly 
the locomotives and coaches are all manufactured in in by indian railways and at that time up to the early 2000s 100% were manufactured by us so in those production units these uh, systems were set up also and they were all ibm 1401s by the way all of these systems were ibm 1401s ibm 1401s were actually front end processors to ibm 360 and ibm uh, the older systems of ibm uh, in the us but in india they were not pre processors they were the main systems because this is all that the americans would give us so when they finally got here in around 1970 when they had a survey of the systems that were uh, installed in india and they came to indian railways they found that their cpu loading was up to 99% in our in our centers the reason was that we were using these things so intensively the highest level of usage of any ibm 1401 was in the indian railways they were quite surprised actually ibm they had been thinking that maybe we'd buy a system 360 we never did that we kept <laughs> we kept using their uh, 1401s up to the 80s we kept using those so so that is uh, as you can see up to 74 then in 1977 which again is quite exceptional because 1977 means this was more than 50 years back or 40 years back there was a, a report was made there was a committee set up and then they set out the road map for it systems for indian railways all functions that is quite an amazing document if you read it now and then that set the pace for the prs system prs i mean passenger reservation system which was the the next innovation that came up so um, in 1978 itself we started studying the the what the functionality for the prs would be and uh, then till 1985 the prs system first functionality was uh, then three agencies were involved in it one was uh, ecil one was cmc and of course indian railways and ecil made their own small system uh, which was uh, based in hyderabad but the main system which was called impress at the time was made by cmc and that was in fortran so it was a fortran system which which was launched in october 85 in uh, delhi and then it was extended to other uh, units and then of course uh, prs the passenger reservation system it continued up to 90 97 really in this form this form was the impress system which was that that fortran system but the problem with the impress was that you it was host based and there were five hosts and each of the hosts you had to you had to uh, install separate terminals for each of these hosts so you had in in delhi you had terminals for the chennai system in mumbai you had terminals for the chennai system and the kolkata system and the delhi system and you had to move from one counter to the other if you wanted to take a get a reservation in trains that were residing on different systems so if you had if you were taking a, a train to from delhi to chennai and back then you would first have to get a reservation from the delhi system and then move to a counter of the chennai system and then take a train from there take a ticket from there then that was proving to be difficult naturally it became very complex so uh, this fully network system which was uh, named concert was then conceptualized and that was taken up by chris so chris had already been set up in 1986 and then this prs concert system was taken up by chris it was a fully networked system and these all the, the actually there is a story behind the prs also when when prs was being developed then ibm had already been pushed out of the country in 1977 and once they understood that this prs system was coming then they were very sure that the only systems the only hardware that could handle the prs system would be ibm so they were waiting that ibm would be called back but as it happened ibm systems were very expensive and we decided that we would go in for digital 
and the first digital used to have these smaller systems pdp 11s and pdp 7s and then when they came up with the vax then amongst the first large applications that was run on vax was uh, prs as you know volumes had started to ramp up very quickly and uh, there were doubts whether the vax would be able to take those uh, volumes but the vax took the volumes and the rest of course as you know is history and again with concert there was uh, another uh, opportunity again we continued with the vax but this time we used uh, what is known as uh, rtr the, the, the operating system is vms on vms uh, they run a uh, uh, routing system which they call rtr which allows wide area distributed uh, network uh, networked database actually it is not a, a database in the modern sense of the word but it allows you to route transactions from one host to the other and that rtr still continues to a certain extent although now we have uh, started to change our platform over but that was quite a revolutionary thing that allowed us to at that time take on such a large load because by that time it had become very very highly loaded this system and the vaxes uh, continue to take the load only because of these technology innovations that we do in fact uh, rtr at that time was launched for the first time by by digital and almost the first installation in any large system was in prs so in the meantime um, this um, freight operations information system also was conceptualized and as you can see in 1986 chris was set up chris was set up only for that originally it was set up only for the freight system and then slowly it took over as you know the prs and then all the other applications of railways but the freight operations again at that time uh, we were touching 200 million tons of traffic freight traffic and there was a thought that how will we go beyond 200 million tons without automating our operations and that is how the freight uh, system freight operations information system was conceptualized and started in this initially the uh, approach that we took was we procured software directly from us uh, it was actually from canada but it was based on the us operations uh, system and that was based on ibm mainframes so we bought an ibm mainframe also however that initial system could not really get past the stage of testing so then in 1997 there was a decision that we would dispense with that system completely we struggled with with it for almost uh, 10 years but then it was decided that we dispense with that and then cmc was taken on board and along with cmc and chris jointly we developed this present version of the freight operation system we're starting with a few modules and then expanding it and uh, voice of course is now still expanding taking care of the new functionalities that we need to implement so it primarily two parts the rake management system and the uh, um, terminal management system of voice and they came on they came on steam by around 2006 the whole thing was implemented 2002 the rake management system was implemented in the meantime there were unreserved tickets used to be just bought across the counter they used to be um, what we call card tickets and those card tickets also they were computerized this one was a very quick um, computerization because it was based from the beginning on rdbms uh, systems so it wasn't too difficult to implement but we decided in april to that we'd launch it on the 15th of august 2002 and uh, 15th of august 2002 we launched the unreserved ticketing system the same day 15th august 2002 we also started e ticketing which was operated initially by irctc even now irctc runs the system but now the back end system is completely developed by by chris because it is a 
the the web application at the back end of course it integrates with the prs so it is interchanging data with the prs system but the front end initially was developed got developed by rctc from the private uh, sector companies and then later in 2014 we took it over chris developed a new version and that new version is now the one that is running uh, which is IRCTC's application actually is actually uh, it, it is run in Chris. Then alongside there were other uh, computerization efforts at that time for our workshops, divisional offices. There was a MIS project that was started in ninety seven, and then it continued for the next six years. And then slowly, that whole the the reason for having distributed applications, which was the unavailability of uh, data networks in the country that slowly lessened data networks became much better now it is difficult for us to think how tight the bandwidth situation was at the turn of the century and uh, at that time it was very difficult to centralize applications and the web also was not that that much developed so we had to distribute our servers also and then exchange information across those servers, which was a difficult thing. By the time we got that uh, that right, it was time to shift over to centralized applications to which now we have started to move. So we are moving towards centralized applications now. So this was the situation by this, this graph shows you till 2009, because after that things became very complex. So this was the situation in 2009. Now I'll just go through this uh, thing a little. This this screen. By 2009, we were here. As I said, we had decided upon these verticals, passenger transport. If you see here, these are the verticals on the top of the screen: passenger transport, freight, rolling stock, fixed infrastructure, materials, human resources, finance. And then if you see the y-axis. The y-axis shows interfaces at the bottom and then transaction processing systems, monitoring and control, planning and analysis, and strategic systems. And the boxes show different uh, IT applications that were being developed or had been thought of. And you can see that this whole canvas had become quite complex. At the bottom are the interfaces that we had thought that that either we were already using interfaces with our customers or the interfaces that we had projected we had forecast that we'd like that we'd need to use in the next few years in 2009 our, uh, this is where we were and we realized that we have got a very large system on our hands it is going to become unmanageable After 2009, there was a period of expansion and then a period of integration. So the expansion period was when applications that had been running, but that had not spread to all the different locations were expanded. For example, freight operations information system was expanded. And we had a control of, we have uh, these train control offices. So the train control offices were also computerized alongside. And those IT systems of the control office were linked to the freight operations system. Then for tickets, we moved to ticket vending machines for our undeserved uh, uh, ticketing systems. And then we got the materials management at that time was, uh, there, were not, no, there was no centralized system, for example. There were all different uh, small space systems that were running in all the zones and the divisions. So we centralized all of those and put them into a centralized materials management system that is now running, which we call integrated materials management system. So, and civil engineering assets and things that we are not looking at before were put into place. For rolling stock, we put into place uh, ERP systems. Some of them we, we tried to implement, then later on we had to change that strategy. And then web portals and web hosting became much more important. And then, then after 2015, the last five years, there's been a lot of integration 
amongst all these applications because we, now information has to move across the applications and the users whether they are railways or whether they are passengers they expect that they'll be able to get information in a in an integrated fashion you know they'll be able to get information uh, from the same interface from the same uh, ui so by by the almost by by 2018 or 19 we had a very very large portfolio of applications and you can all see them here ticketing and passenger services we had a large number of applications from the core passenger reservation system to the nget is the is the web interface for that and then unreserved ticketing and this and that and National train inquiry system and then handed terminals for TTEs. We had taken that up as a separate project. So we had a large number of uh, systems there. Freight and operations, again, FOIST was the main one. Then there were other additions to uh, freight operations. For example, a, a, an application that would allow you to get a bird's eye view of how all your trains were moving inside the country and so that you could do some. Um, daily planning for moving those individual trains and all of these things got centralized because it became possible to centralize them and when you centralize them you can get a much better um, you can get a much better feel of the planning because what is happening is number of trains is increasing and uh, planning has to be much more precise so that you can run your trains efficiently planning for capacity of the railway line, planning for your crews so that your train crew is available when required. What had begun to happen was uh, that because the number of trains had increased a lot, the crews were being given very unrealistic working conditions. They had to, they had to stay away from home for long stretches at a time. Sometimes they had to work more than eight hours at a time and it is very strenuous work running a train. Sometimes they would get only for a day, they were at a remote station, but they got only two hours of running and the whole system was uh, not conducive to their well-being. So when we put in this crew management system and slowly we expanded it to all the individual locations, we found that the crews, uh, uh, scheduling of the crews became much better, availability of the crews became better and of course uh, their well-being also improved. So things like this, train scheduling, uh, again, used to be a, a skill. It used to be an art, actually, which was exercised by a few experts. And uh, that now is part of, a, of our what we call satsang, which is a software aided train scheduling system. And slowly, all these uh, slots, all these uh, building blocks fell into place. And we started to the process of interchanging information amongst these applications. So same rolling stock also, rolling stock, rolling asset management, rolling stock, then fixed assets, all these fixed infrastructure, so managing all the fixed infrastructure, different type of applications, and then finance, materials and HR. So all of these uh, systems were brought and put into place. But the result was, that they were a large number of systems, they still are, and they are on diverse platforms because they've come up slowly as the years have passed. So this is how this uh, are physically, this is what things are looking at, uh, looking like right now. I'll just uh, run you through this slide. So I had to give you an idea. Most of the applications are now centralized. They are in, in centralized in Chris, most of them. Although uh, a couple of them are now also in Railtel's data center. So they are with Railtel, they are being managed by Railtel, one or two of them. And this, of course, uh, through this secure network, they are interacting with their users through either the internet increasingly internet or we also have 
two trusted private networks. So, which we run, which are based on these lines that we lease separately. They are for ticketing and for our freight operations. So, freight operations, train control, they all run on one trusted private network. And ticketing, reserved, unreserved, these run on the uh, what we call the unified ticketing network. So, we have two of these. We still have some VSATs in remote locations uh, for primarily for freight where we have coal loading at the at the pit pit heads of the coal mines so coal mine pit heads there are some of the their, their connectivity issues sit still but they are getting better now and access now is through increasingly through mobile devices browsers of course and through the internet access of different types our trusted private networks we are connecting still to some green screen terminals you will have seen that our passenger reservation system still has got green screens in some of the locations. We are shifting over to uh, um, to, to client server and uh, thin clients there. But still some green screen terminals you'll see. And then we have these kiosks. These are these uh, automatic ticket vending machines. We have now mobile devices, thin clients. Now, of course, you can since you can buy your tickets over the internet. So you are able to directly connect through the internet also. Uh, but these are for the, the private networks connectivities for our own internal users. So they are also now connecting through a variety of devices. Then we also have some distributed servers. For example, PRS still continues to be a distributed system. We have four servers. We used to have more. We have reduced that to four, but we have four sets of servers. One in uh, Delhi, then Mumbai, Kolkata, and Chennai. So we have four sets of servers. And we have this remote DR uh, center in Sikandraba, where, for example, uh, in, in, in uh, Kolkata, about, uh, more than, about a year back, there was a fire in one of the buildings there. And that building coincidentally also housed our PRS system. So that PRS system had to be turned off, not because there was some fire damage there, but because the upper floors had caught fire. So the fire department shut off the power until they could do their investigation. So at that time, we were able to move our PRS uh, system. We were able to seamlessly migrate it to the DR in Sikandrabad. And for four or five days, we ran it from Sikandrabad. Then we were able to replicate the data back to, to Calcutta and start it up. And the disruption was not noticed. Not, not, not. Uh, people didn't get to know. Otherwise, had we not been able to do that, moving to our DR site, it may have uh, disrupted operations a little. So this is how the system looks like right now. One thing that we had not been looking at for so long was that we had been looking at data as an adjunct to the applications. So an IT application, a software that we had made would be accessing the data. And we never looked at data as a separate layer. But when we started to take uh, an architectural view of our systems, we realized that data is sort of, it dances to its own tune. So it has to be first uh, identified it has to be mapped to real world entities. And then the attributes have to be managed. So once we started that activity, we got uh, to the concept of data hubs. We are still working on that. And as you can see, there are a number of uh, very large number of uh, data hubs in which the data has to be defined and the definitions have to be standardized so that the mapping of the real processes and the objects that are associated with each process is more realistic than it is right now. And we have found that that is the basis of getting correct results from your analytic systems. Actually, this has become more accentuated, more pronounced ever since we have started to analyze the data that we have then we find that unless the relationships amongst the data 
um, elements is properly defined, there are going to be problems with your analysis. So data analysis suffers if your data management is not up to the mark. Your data governance has to be up to the mark. So that is one very important learning that we have now, the data governance part. So as I said, as we move into the future, we have realized the, the importance of having a very strong data governance system in place. As I said, um, increasingly there are cross-functional processes that increasingly are being managed by IT systems. Um, excuse me. So, um, so, so this is uh, just uh, so something that shows that now a process, now increasingly processes are cutting across organizational boundaries. They are cutting across departmental boundaries in the organization. And the expectation is that previously people would not uh, mind if their payments were uh, made after a couple of months. That was the norm. But now uh, vendors have are, are much more uh, clued in and uh, their, their whole process is much more uh, streamlined. So we, the payments to, to vendors, even large payments have to go within a matter of days and they have to go directly into bank accounts and things like that. So there is a lot of cross-functional uh, processes that have to be mapped to our IT systems. For example, if you see this, uh, the example, that is the second example, that is when a work is sanctioned, if a work, uh, a work is a project, as a project is done, some engineering uh, project is executed, then it sanction the placement of its work order, the measurement of the progress of the system, and then the bills are linked to the progress of that particular project. And then payment is also made directly to the contractor's bank. And that whole thing is moving seamlessly without any manual intervention. So that, that is the, the reason where, why we realize that if we continue with this ad hoc development, then we will uh, end up with, we may have individual systems which are the best, but we'll end up with a combined system that is not uh, the, the best that we can have. And that is how this enterprise architecture effort uh, was started by us. So these are some of the priorities. Now, what, what we are doing is we are taking a, a customer centric view. So these are some of the, the priorities that start with a customer centric view. This is what now the organization itself is doing. I mean, it is part of the government's policy now that whatever you do has to be uh, customer centric and our customers are passengers and freight customers and giving them a better experience, building up the freight market share, which is in the benefit, benefits the nation in the, in the, in the benefit of the overall nation is that we move more traffic by rail as far as we can, because it is a cheaper and more efficient uh, method of moving traffic. And then the last mile should be taken up by other modes of transport. And this whole thing should be seamless. And uh, that, that will increase the efficiency of your logistics across the country. And it will reduce the costs. And it will reduce the cost of your exports. It will also reduce the cost of uh, of uh, material within the country, will reduce the cost of consumer goods. So increasing the freight market share by Indian railways is beneficial in that direction. So that is one. And that is how we are working with partner organizations also, because that national logistics ecosystem has to be created. And that means that 
the information that we have in our systems, apart from uh, moving within the organization, also has to move across organizational boundaries to um, our other partners like container train operators, like um, container freight station operators, third party transportation uh, managers, shipping lines. So we have many partners with whom we have to interchange information. That also is something that we have now planned in and we have started moving in that direction. Then a lot of optimization is possible now. So optimization of train operations and therefore managing our assets better. A lot of IoT is possible now. So IoT and sensor-based uh, diagnostics, that is something that is coming up in a big way with its shift because large volumes of data are then captured by these diagnostic equipment and large uh, volumes of data has to be moved across the network. And of course, by better financial control. And uh, as I said, upgrading skills of the employees is another very important area. So ma making a learning and development system that is able to um, leverage the technologies that we have now, that is also part of the whole system that uh, we need to put into place. So this is how we now look at it, is that whenever we offer services, it depends on the customer's demand, demands and the organizational capabilities that we have. And then only we can offer services and the services are technology led. So it is a transformation of the, of the organization. That is a technology led transformation. So you have existing systems and you have a future vision. You have demands from your customers and you have new technologies available. So considering all of this, you have to see where you need new capabilities to be built up. You build up those capabilities and then be able to provide technology enabled services, new services. And that is the direction that our set of uh, our, our entire information ecosystem has to move to. And that is the objective of our move to the future, which is the enterprise architecture that we are developing now. And as uh, I had mentioned the last time also is that the business application, data and technology, all three layers have to be looked at independently. And since they are related to each other, then those relations also have to be, those connections have to be understood. Data is, uh, as I said, has, is emerging as the area that is that requires the largest effort because applications, business processes, something that you study. But data independently, we've not been studying. So, And then increasingly, the security of the systems, IT security, integration of all the components, how do you measure the effectiveness? How do you govern this whole system? This, these are the eight elements and these are defined in the India Enterprise Architecture Framework with which we are working. We are, we are working as per the in India Enterprise Architecture Framework. Okay, so um, how much time do I have now? Yeah, another uh, five to seven minutes. Okay. So now, now I'll I'll wind up. I think uh, basic idea is is given. Now I'll just move fast and then we take questions because questions. I think I would like to have more questions than I can uh, give you a better idea of what we are doing. So currently uh, we have business processes, applications, data. Right now it is more a discrete set of uh, IT systems that is running. Data is based on the database linked to each application. Technology, of course, has come up differently. As, as each application has come up, technology has got linked to that particular application. We find it naturally difficult to move out of one technology stack. And uh, security, we have started some initiatives. We have taken ISO 27001 certification for our uh, data center. We've been able to manage it. 
the reason is that now security is very very important you can't neglect it but naturally uh, we need an integrated security posture so to say so uh, that is uh, definitely on our roadmap and integration also as as i said that we have started on that path but planning uh, some uh, implementations yes ai ml implementations in chris yes we have started on that path uh recently we have a couple of use cases for example uh the recent one is uh the, on how we should uh, structure the for example one recent very interesting one is that how are trains moving and whether they are uh, they, they are their movement is getting affected by um level crossings or unmanned level crossings because sometimes there are interruptions at unmanned level crossings or level crossing gates not being closed so that interlocks uh, are are not allowing trains to move so are there delays on that account so that shows you where you need a road overbridge or a road underbridge so that is one use case that we have recently we have run so we are we have started using ai and that is where as i said the reason we found that the quality of the data is so important so we are using uh, we have started we have an ai ml we have actually an analytics group that is doing this job and we are expanding that group also so target state again a much more integrated system data science actually um, we are uh, we we have realized that is uh, very important and but it is a very a specific area of knowledge so we are looking at how we can create those data science groups within the railways who will then be able to get a uh, analytics practice practical analytics practice which will work across the organization so that is something we will discuss it during the q and a also so our uh, enterprise architecture project of course is uh, as as you know we call it vistar vistar and vistar has these components actually so a set of blueprints describing the current and target architecture actually it's very important that we understand the target architecture that is where we want to go we we have a horizon of 5 years so after 5 years what is our expectation what will our customers want what will the customers not want based on that what are the it systems that we'll require and then we have a road map with the transition states based on the gaps and we uh, what we have realized is that it is not enough to say that we have to move from point a to point b we have to say that when we want to move to point b what are the skills that will require so that skills upgrade also has to be factored into that road map so your road map has to have okay fine not only will we move from point a to point b but this is the capabilities that we'll have to develop develop in our workforce so for that what do we need to do to develop skills in the workforce also you need it for that it what is the skill upgrade that you need of your it workforce so that entire thing unless you do you will not be able to move to the next level so skills upgrade is very important and principles and rules are very important so that you can then follow those rules you can create rules and follow those rules so that you have a consistent uh, movement towards the the target it system and then set of enabling technologies and governance governance uh, we are hoping to have a comprehensive governance system in place so that what we do today is not lost there is a continuity that is built into the organization by having a set of people who are who are mandated to look after the it the ea implementation and also to make sure that the ea remains responsive to coming needs of the organization it is not just a static uh, thing so to create an enabling uh, environment we have uh, put in an application portfolio management system which we call paridrishya and an api gateway which is actually one of the very important uh, parts of the system of a unified uh, system uh, of railways this is called which we call prava and which we have just started publishing apis through this so 
you will have seen that now Umang was one of the Ministry of IT's uh, applications, and Umang was linking at the back end to different uh, departments. And now Umang also has some railway information coming in, and that is all coming through our API gateway through Prava. Some of the use cases that we have uh, that that we have uh, discovered recently are these end-to-end -end logistics, the one one area that we'll be moving. So as you can see, consigners, they 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 book their uh, wagons and they book their rakes. Actually, rakes are trains, full train loads, which is what we do. So they give a forwarding note and then they are able to load their consignments. And then they have interfaces. These, this system in the middle is the IT system that we have now, which is cobbled up right now, but which needs to be uh, integrated much better. And it has now links to not only the banks, but the GST also. And then these links that are API based links to the consigner and the consignee, these are the ones that we are now putting into place so that there is no manual intervention in this whole process. The whole process is, is IT based and minimal manual intervention, you still have information, the relevant information moving across. Same with rolling stock management. Rolling stock, this is now purely internal thing, except for third party rolling stock vendors, you can see the bottom left corner. But here also the information now is beginning to move and the, the, the target architecture is that it will move automatically through this entire uh, this, this entire set of uh, processes. As you can see here, another view of the rolling stock vertical. We realize that one very important uh, thing that we have to do is to look at different life cycles of mainly assets, life cycle of assets, life cycle of data that we store different uh, life cycles of our processes. For example, if we look at the life cycle of a passenger journey. So the passenger journey starts when the passenger starts thinking about moving from point A to point B. Will he use train? Will he go by air? Will he use road transport? That is the time when that entire journey starts, when the life cycle starts. If you have an effective publicity, a system in place, then he'll at least know what are the services that are open to him. He'll know where to go to search out the schedules that are open to him. And from there, ticketing, finding out when his train is going to reach the station, is it late, how late it is, reaching the station, at the station being able to see where his train is, how he should move to that particular platform, on the platform, where his coach is going to come. When he gets on the coach, being able to check in and then being able to locate the train as it moves across once it moves from the station where is he he should be able to see it on a, on a screen in the station or on his mobile phone or whichever way and when he reaches his destination then he should be able to to understand where he has to move out of the station for his uh, at the destination uh, city wherever he is going how does he move in the inside the station to reach that particular gate? And all this information has to be moving, this consistent information coming to his mobile phone, to the display devices that are there in the station, to his mobile or, or, or to, to his uh, uh, PC, to his laptop. All of them have to be consistent. So consistency, so that entire unified information has to be provided to that passenger. In the same way for freight also, consistent information has to be provided across multifarious means of uh, accessing the information and similarly internally to the organization also. So if you look at the life cycle of one of your locomotives, it is a 35 year life cycle. But across that 35 year life cycle, information consistency must be maintained and it should be from a centralized source, logically centralized, so that you get the same information as you maintain and manage the 
locomotive. So locomotives, coaches, wagons, all of them, we look at, we have started to look at the life cycle. Another very important area that is coming up is costing. Now, with the advent of all these IT systems in place, different types of information that we have all stored in our databases, then we have the opportunity to do much more granular costing and then use that costing database to develop further passenger services, look at different freight services, look at the feasibility of projects for budgets, third party leasing, all these kind of non-fair revenues. If you can cost what you are doing accurately, then it is uh, much easier to get a more accurate view of all these uh, things that, that you can do and make your operations much more efficient and uh, passenger friendly, customer friendly. This is uh, again uh, an overview of what we are doing right now. This is a transition architecture actually. So how this works, if you just see the, the bottom, at the bottom, you can see it starts with the central data center and the, the servers and the hyper-converged infrastructure and all that we have. Moving towards the cloud, we haven't moved to the cloud yet, but moving towards the cloud. And then um, the logical data model, the data dictionary, and the, the master data, we, we, have, we have a master data management system also that is coming up. So the data layer, and then on top of the data layer, we have these uh, applications, the application layers here. And different applications are moving through this integration layer and then to these common gateways, portals, and I'll encircle the API gateway because it is becoming one of the most important parts of our IT uh, system because it allows us to uh, interoperate and it allows us to, uh, to, to interchange data with our partners automatically without having to go through any manual intervention. So for that, the, the security is very important. So perimeter security and security zones, that is uh, something that we have uh, implemented. And then we go through trusted private networks or the internet and then various devices through which different customers can access the different users can access the information. And on the right top is this new uh, area that has come up, which is the embedded, embedded uh, devices. As I said, a lot of IoT related uh, work is now um, coming up in the future. We can see that a lot of embedded devices will come in as soon as they come in, then this whole issue of edge data centers and then managing large volumes of data will become accentuated. They have just started to come in and we can see that in future that will become one of the major types of traffic that is coming into our system here. And um, as far as security is concerned, we are getting all our, our, our feeds are also going to cert in to ensure that there's no internet related internet attacks coming on our systems. And another new area is the social media and the unstructured data that's coming through social media. And that also to be analyzed through this analytics and AI system, this uh, practice that we are putting in place now. So, so going through this, we hope that we'll reach a planned, um, platform, IT platform for the Indian Railways. So this was basically the, this is basically what I wanted to take you through. Now questions, if there are any questions, then uh, I'd like to answer them. Super, fantastic uh, presentation. Very, very uh, interesting to understand how we gone through this journey of uh, three levels. Uh, so one of the things that came up, which you already answered is AML. You said that you are in the initial stages. How about uh, data science and uh, other elements? Cloud, yes. also you said you are 
just explore. Yes, actually, what we have realized is that uh, see the information that uh, the users need right now. There are two types of users: external users, of course, uh, external to the organization. We are uh, approaching that basically by uh, interchanging information with them as per their requirement. So for that, we are trying to standardize the uh, information that we publish on our API gateway. So that is the approach there. But internally for planning purposes, there is an increasing need to analyze the data and then that requires the use of AIML also. So there, uh, unless you have a very broad based, uh, um, you know, a broad based look at what you want, it becomes difficult to uh, give people what they want. I mean, the, the users have to be involved uh, to, to, to be able to take this uh, information. So we are trying to broad base that a little, broad base our AI ML practice, broad base the analytics practice a little by involving users also. So, so that is what, but yes, it is going to come up. The data, the data science part is uh, going to come up in a big way and very quickly because there is a need. Again, it has thrown into uh, focus the need for data governance. And uh, that is another thing because unless your data is accurate, even if the algorithms are right, you will not get the correct result. So that is the biggest thing. Then I, I thought I'll just take up some of these questions here. There is one about uh, help from overseas consultants um, from Europe or China. Well, what we have done is um, uh, we have been in touch with, for example, Deutsche Bahn. We have had a partnership uh, in the past. So we have seen what, what, what they are using. And uh, also some of the US railroads for freight, we have uh, looked at their uh, information systems. But again, Indian Railways is, uh, is different also from these other railway systems. So there's not, nothing that we can sort of lift and shift and use here. But definitely we try to exchange as much information with other railways as we can. But there are very few vertically integrated railways now in the, in the world left. Only China Railways, China Railways is not very forthcoming with information. So it is difficult to get much out of them. So, I guess put it in speaker mode. Uh, Mr. Mathur, I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, I am sure that you must be having a lot of apps for your uh, organization's use. Uh, you know, there should be an app for a TTE, app for uh, customers, app for uh, freight forwarding. A lot of apps should be in use. I was looking for some information on how many apps are in use. Could you just uh, let us know? Um, yes, I mean, apps are coming up now because now we have, we have realized that apps are probably the most convenient interface that is uh, in use. So we have apps for users, of course, for, for our passengers, we have an, an app that, is, uh, that covers various parts of the passenger requirements information requirements of a passenger. For example, there's an NTES app, National Train Inquiry System, that tells you where the trains are, how they are running. Uh, we have recently uh, given an app to our, to, for some of the trains we've started that, to our TTs, the traveling ticket uh, examiners. Yeah. Now they have an app through which they can uh, look at, uh, they, they can understand which births are vacant, then they can book people on those births. Uh, yeah. Through that app, we were actually constrained uh, by the fact that it was very difficult on a moving train to get the kind of connectivity that would that that uh, would allow us to do these things. But now connectivity is improving, so and the the technology behind the apps also is improving. Store and forward has become much easier. So uh, yeah. now we have started to put in apps. I I was also looking for some information on your communication system. Uh, rail tell kind of thing. So I just wanted to know how is your, uh, uh, no, are you managing communication system or is it a separate entity? See communication, what we do is that we manage only the, the basics of the network, but otherwise we take a lot of our communication from, from rail tell also, because the backbone that we use is mainly rail tells. 
and uh, we have wherever we have our own private network we are using railtel's uh, lease lines we have uh, diversity so it is railtel plus one more operator generally but uh, railtel normally is there with us so the network is basically uh, being managed by railtel but we have our own noc where up to the first level of the network we are uh, looking at the status of the channels and the devices so that we can tell our service providers when there is a failure uh brilliant presentation uh, one minute like can i interrupt here please uh, uh, i think uh, we we appeal others can also get a chance so i just want to check with uh, sharad ji uh, what percentage of your development gets uh, in house and what uh, i if, uh, do you outsource if at all do you outsource and also if what is the total strength of the people you have who are involved in the development work ha huh, right now of course uh, we, it has been uh, happening in phases our model actually is that we get the development done from uh, external agencies as and when required and but we do take over the operation and maintenance of the applications that is that has been our philosophy that operations and maintenance should be with us because operations and maintenance you know that strategic control should be with us in some form the uh, maintenance of the hardware of course is outsourced in the normal way but uh, but increasingly we have found that in some cases it is difficult to uh, outsource uh, software development because now the requirements are coming in small uh, increments and possibilities now of uh, you know uh, creating software in small increments is also there because you can create small services and you can uh, implement them so uh, right now there are no large development uh, efforts being done by uh, external outsourced uh, i mean external parties but in the past uh, we have used cmc tcs uh, capgemini lnt you name it they have all been yeah. pro they have all been our uh, you know service providers at some point or the other okay. so it is it is completely it just depends on what works sure but we are open to it but uh, what, what is your strength now how many people are uh, uh, the relevant people the development technical people we have about 800 people now wow uh, okay our, our technical people recently we have been taking on board more people Okay. but my estimate is that actually railways needs a core of about 4500 5000 exactly i was thinking so yes, yes. because uh, this is a very small uh, Absolutely. number Absolutely. and once our architecture is in place then i expect that uh, there will be a you know certain uh, yes. acceleration of the development and then yes. we'll have to take in parties from outside and we'll have to do what we are trying to do is to build up a very robust uh, practice of outsourcing it requirements that itself yep. is a bit difficult in public procurement absolutely but we are uh, trying to build that up also so that insight also will be very useful as to how you actually govern this outsourcing and uh, monitor performance and uh, how do you reward uh, good performance and so on so that but that we can discuss at some later time oh, yes <laughs> that, that's you. a big thing that is an issue that has to yeah. be thank you uh, i will leave the floor to other people to question right so sure. thank you so much yeah, there is a question on irctc versus right. chris what is the scope and uh... okay so so right now what irctc is doing some of the see irctc is managing the uh, ticketing really the reserve ticketing actually not the unreserved tickets are not managed by them they have of course the tourism and all those other departments they have tourism and the rail needs and all that but as far as ticketing is concerned the reserve ticketing the web ticketing is what they handle um, the the front end of that web ticketing system is what they handle so as i said up to 2014 even that web application was uh, had been they had got it developed and they were managing it but in 2014 we had to rearchitect the whole thing because uh, you remember that around 2014 there was it had really slowed down it was not able to take care of the load suddenly we had a surge of transactions on the online system and naturally this old uh, system that they had developed was not able to take that load 
so uh, then they request and of course uh, it was our mandate also so we stepped in and took over that particular the web application we actually rewrote the whole thing and uh, because of that once because new technologies had come in 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 memory data grids and all we could use so now the capacity of that front end has gone up but still some things like they also have the air ticketing and this and that that they manage themselves so they have a data center where they host all those things you know air ticketing and something to do with tourism their their tourism website and all that but the rail ticketing is now completely being managed by chris the front end is being managed for i mean is run by us for iacdc they give us the money and the back end system the prs is of course run for the railways and we get money from the railways we are running on a no profit basis we are a society so it is on a cost basis completely whatever cost we incur we ask the railways to give it to us a railways or iacdc also we have the same arrangement Interesting. Are there any more questions, or uh, we have one more question? Uh, this is on the uh, customer centricity. Uh, so, what has been see one one of the uh, one of your uh, important initiative for innovation uh, has been to reduce time taken by customer to book ticket because that is a, a common interaction. So, what has been the improvement and? Uh, Uh, what is what is your next goal from a customer centricity perspective um well the idea basically is uh, that you know uh, we should be able to give the customer as much information as we can so that when he is buying the ticket you, you know he has as much information as as he can uh, as he needs to buy that ticket you know he should understand recently you will have seen even there were other sites which were doing it but now even we have started to predict give him a, the customer him or her a prediction of how likely his like ticket is to be uh, is going to be confirmed so idea is that he gets uh, as much information in advance so that it doesn't take him much time to he doesn't have to be uh, you know run from one site to the other to get hold of uh, Uh, you know uh, to 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 actually book a ticket i mean if he wants to book a ticket he should be able to do it in one one screen do it as quickly as possible get all the alternatives in one screen so we have put in these journey planners then we have also now looking at uh, journey planners which take care of gaps for example uh, uh, the classic example is if you want to go to j and k to 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 shrinagar then there's a gap in the middle because right now the, the railway line stops at katra and then from katra you have to till banihal there is a road bridge so having a combined uh, journey for that being able to plan that journey those kind of initiatives we have taken improving the interface and then of course speeding up the website as as much as we can so that people don't have to wait for it those are the initiatives that we have taken right now but the larger initiative is you know having these combined uh, ticketing systems across uh, modes of travel you know multimodal uh, ticketing systems all those initiatives are across ministries which are coming up so i think in the next one or two years we can see those coming up they will be game changers really and also right now we have some of these uh, make my trips and all on board with us but that we intend to broad base much more so once the policy is fixed for that then lot of these other players will come in to the what we call the travel ecosystem and we'll be linking to them dr rajaram i have only one question now uh, yeah. mr mathur uh, we had these unmanned railway gates and uh, in remote, right. remote locations you know they used to be uh, unmanned railway gates and uh, i think uh, over last year or year before uh, that was kind of put to an end saying there won't be any more unmanned railway gates i i don't know what is the status and secondly when you are talking about rolling stock how do you manage rolling stock with remote locations you know there must be number of locations which are inaccessible to you so how does uh, you know the system take care of these okay so unmanned railway crossings of course uh, the the policy of the railways now is to just eliminate the unmanned railway crossings 
so unmanned railway crossing the problem is ki there are some formal ones there are some informal ones so first all the formal ones i think by and large they have been eliminated so either they have been manned or road over bridges under bridges have been made so the idea is that as few uh, grade crossings you know at grade crossings uh, as possible we should have but uh, that it is an ongoing exercise because uh, there are some informal ones so informal ones also you have to you have to stop and you have to create some way of people to cross over the track you can't just fence it and then expect that the person will not cross because he needs some way to cross so at least a little bit uh, down the line he should have some sort of a method to cross it either foot over bridge or increasingly these underpasses that we are creating there you must have seen um, you know within one day an underpass has been created by using these prefab concrete structures and all that so uh, that is it hopefully and now increasingly some of the lines are being made on viaducts so wherever there is uh, there there is uh, um where there are people living and uh, there you know where where there are uh, built up areas there uh, the railway lines are being built on viaducts so that people can freely pass through animals can freely pass through also so all those things are coming up so uh, that is it your second question was regarding on a rolling stock oh rolling so stock how, how do you rolling? manage rolling stock in remote locations yes yes sorry see you now rolling stock is an interesting thing because uh, traditionally the way we were managing rolling stock was that we were running it we had uh, um, periodic maintenance schedules so how it works is that there is a maintenance facility for uh, for locomotives they have their maintenance sheds and coaches also have uh, their homing sheds and they have a period after which they come back to that shed for maintenance and coaching stock they have the system of secondary and primary maintenance so they they move to to their destination there they have secondary maintenance then they come back and they have primary maintenance and then periodically they go to their maintenance facility for their periodic maintenance and then of course every few years they go for periodic overhaul now from that we want to move to a predictive maintenance regime so recently we have started to fix what we call this omrs which is actually a wayside uh, detection systems so what they do is that they they are they they, they have some sensors which capture some parameters of the trains as they go past and then they um, analyze those parameters and then raise alarms in case they find that there are some parameters that are going beyond the permitted levels permissible levels so that is in its early days right now but uh, that will be the real game changer because as far as information systems is concerned because then there will be a lot of data coming in from these wayside locations and then a lot of analysis has to be done of that uh, data to be able to reach the right conclusions right now we will not dispense with our periodic maintenance but as this regime gets more and more streamlined stabilized and uh, reliable then slowly pro probably we can move to a predictive maintenance regime that is uh, that is the thought behind this whole thing thanks a lot thanks a lot one uh, last question mr mahapur ji uh, see the accidents uh, what is the latest technology you are planning to reduce accidents uh, two trains uh, coming in the same line uh, signaling uh, is the issue and so many other things uh, so all that, that is not really in our purview in crisp because that is uh, pertaining to signals and that i mean we are looking only at the control office uh, part but in any case they they railways now putting in place that tcas system uh, they have this uh, uh, tcas which uh, stands for uh, train control and uh, something system so i uh, just forget the name but so what tcas does is that it enables uh, information to reach the driver in case trains are likely to be on the same track so it takes care of collisions whether rear end or or head on also allows it has some provisions that if there is a derailment on one of the rail uh, one of the lines then on the adjacent line you get a warning 
So that TCAS is uh, one of them. And uh, of course, we also have GPS devices on our uh, locomotives now, but GPS devices, uh, they are not built for safety applications. So, I mean, they don't have the reliability that is required for safety applications right now. In the future, perhaps they can also be used. They can be leveraged. So that track circuiting, better signals, this whole uh, thing has to be put in place to ensure that you reduce your accidents. Better control actually is, is uh, the key to it, actually. But as we uh, into the future, uh, trains also will become smarter by themselves. Uh, yes, in fact, I, I didn't mention it, but there is also a smart coach that we have uh, recently, a couple of years back, we have come up we have developed that smart coach. So the idea of the smart coach is that apart from onboard diagnostics, there are also communication systems for, with the external world. So smart coach, and I foresee that once 5G comes in, perhaps it will be a game changer for us. 5G, okay. Yes, because actually, you know, the problem has been so far has been that what works in a static situation, in a running train, it doesn't work very well. So communication doesn't work very well. The cellular communication doesn't work very well in running trains unless it's voice. But uh, data, there are so much, they're fading and this and that. There are so many issues. But uh, technology increasing, bandwidth increasing, that, that has uh, improved situations right now. But you use the fiber optic lines, right? Uh, going along with the track rather than over. Yes, yes. fiber optic. We have, five, fortunately, we have fiber optic running across all our, I mean, alongside the railway lines. So we use that. We have tapped them at the major stations. And then, I mean, they are, we've tapped them. And then from that tapping, we can uh, either run fiber or run copper and use that as a communication medium. So we do that. Plus, we also use it for backhaul. So with 5G, how, what is the approach? Uh, right now, uh, wait and watch. <laughs> right now, uh, no, I, I mean, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, policy right now that uh, I know. But I, I feel, I, I have a feeling that once it comes in, it will definitely be a game changer. I hope it will be. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, you, uh, one minute. Very, very insightful. May, may, I, may I quickly ask a quick right. question? Okay. okay, please. This is Gopal here. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I shared my experiences earlier on in 1988. Did right. one beginnings of the freight management. Okay. And I was fortunate to work with Mr. Sampat, the then railway board member. Okay. He was mooting an idea that we should train people all along, all over the country on part-time basis in databases, only DBA3 mm -hmm. plus was there, so mm -hmm. that they can spend some time, 10 rupee per uh, record or 50 rupees per half a day mm -hmm. and make the manual data entry possible. Touched upon mm -hmm. a very important point. Mm -hmm. a very, very, very important because you have rightly said that the train on the move is different. Mm -hmm. Static mm -hmm. train is different. Right. So with the spate of accidents, near misses that we are seeing these days, do you think mm -hmm. we should go back to that method, teach them Oracle and give them 10 rupee per hour so that they are also having a manual backup right through the track everywhere, in every village, every station? Uh, I think now maybe that you will not uh, require because automatic uh, collection of data is what is now feasible. Actually, at that time, it was not very feasible. At that time, actually, telecom was not uh, really developed in the country. Now, with better telecom, you should be able to, uh, and better sensors and uh, IoT in place, you should be able to uh, use automatic collection of data. Because uh, when we started looking at the data, we realized that uh, if you collect data very close to the source, when you collect data close to the source and in as automated a method as possible, uh, and you ensure that uh, the data as it travels through its life cycle, it is uh, scrutinized as it travels. Then you will uh, end up with uh, the quality of data that you need to actually do an analysis. That is uh, one place where we are finding it difficult because right now, if the quality of data, suppose data is in the insufficient or it is incorrect or it is part of a transaction that has not 
reached its logical conclusion and it is essentially abandoned. So those are areas, those are sources of inaccuracy in the data. So manually, whether you can now enter so much data, whether you can put the people in place, I don't know. I go by your discussion. Uh, but one interesting thing that you have said and which is very important is that what we realized was that just by educating uh, our users in basic information systems, we found that we were they were able to appreciate information systems better and therefore the acceptability of those information systems went up. Wherever we did this, for example, in one of our manufacturing units, we did it. Wherever we educated our users, we sent them on uh, courses, you know, on IT. Not necessarily just the use of that technology, but even the underlying technology. Some idea of databases, some idea of operating systems, some idea of data storage. We found that they responded much better. And they became allies in the implementation of those systems. You know, IT system is so strange. The same system, depending on how the user looks at it, can be successful or it can be unsuccessful. The same thing, same system. In one place, it's successful because you have a champion, you have positive people there. The same system is a failure in another location just because of the attitude of the people or because of some interpersonal issues or because they feel that they are getting out of control. You know, so you run into these uh, interesting insights <laughs> when you start the implementation. But the, the, what you are saying, the idea that yes, your users, you should educate so that they, uh, they appreciate the information systems that are being implemented there, that is very well taken and that is essential. I mean, that, that is very, very important types. Maybe it's something that we are neglecting right now. for uh, you know, staying patiently and answering all our questions. I know uh, we have slightly taken more of your time, but uh, no, thanks very much. We truly appreciate uh, your participation as well as contributions to SPIN Chennai as part of the SPIN DTM initiative. And uh, thanks to all the participants uh, you know, who have been uh, also patiently uh, you know, uh, staying back and uh, uh, raising all the questions, relevant questions, what has been troubling them in their mind uh, to get to know about the railways. Very good. Thanks a lot once again. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Looking forward in, uh, to meeting you all in another session of Spin Channel. Thank you.